Good morning, church. It is Sunday morning, and it is a kind of cool, wet, messy Sunday morning here. But I hope things are going well for you there. We, um, of course, as always, miss seeing you. But so long as it is best to love one another and our neighbors this way, I am happy to stare into this camera and talk to you in eager anticipation of being able to see at least the top half of your faces again. We've been talking about sacraments for the past few weeks, and we're going to kind of uh, probably wrap that up today. Uh, sacraments are, just by way of review, these moments in which we as the church tell the story of God in our lives with our bodies. Um, and as we tell the story of God in our bodies, what happens is God comes into these moments with us and he shapes us and he forms us, telling or being a part of rather that storytelling experience. He makes us into a certain kind of people. And so the sacraments are uh, practices usually in the life of the church, like uh, we have talked about communion, where we tell the story of the body and the blood of Christ broken and shed for us. And it's through that moment of communion at the table, through telling that story through bread and wine, that God stands to shape us and call us to being a certain kind of people. It is through the sacrament of baptism that we are reformed, that our identity is changed, and then God spends a lifetime uh, after we have told the story of Jesus is death and burial and resurrection and our baptism um, God spends a lifetime changing us and forming us into Jesus like people these are how the sacraments work they are embodied they tell stories God meets us in that storytelling and he changes us and forms us into his kind of people who can then go out into the world. And there are other sacraments that we could talk about, um, although theologians and different church traditions have sometimes argued about what the actual list of sacraments is, but it's at times like this that I want to remind you that sacrament is not in the Bible. It is just a way of talking about things like communion and baptism that draw out the deeper meanings present in scripture. It's a handy way of talking and thinking about these subjects. And so some of the other sacramental things that people will sometimes discuss, it's helpful to think about them in these ways are things like marriage and how marriage is this embodied thing in our lives that for married people, God uses to form and shape them into people that can um, take his mission into the world. Other people will talk about uh, the process of dying or funerals or that entire um, end part of life is a sacramental moment where we lean into our hope and the resurrection of God and God can work even in the midst of that darkness in a community to remind them that he is victorious and death is not the end and uh, we could go on like this for a while but the one thing um, that I do want to pick up and continue on with for just a few minutes this morning is a way of uh, kind of drawing all of this talk about sacraments together in a way of kind of making a, a final application and a push out into the world is I want to talk about the sacrament of worship and in one sense this isn't anything that we haven't talked about before this is a lot of review but I want to talk about it in such a way through sacramental lens uh, so that we can in turn go out and do something useful with it and so let me begin with a reading from Revelation 4. And if you've been around me long, you know this is one of my favorite texts in all of the Bible. Uh, but Revelation 4, and then we will uh, set that aside for a few minutes. We'll talk about worship for a bit, and then we will come back to it. Uh, after this, I looked, and there was a door that had been opened in heaven. The first voice that I had heard, which sounded like a trumpet, said to me, Come up here, and I will show you what must, must take place after this. At once I was in a spirit-inspired trance, and I saw a throne in heaven, and someone was seated on the throne. The one seated there looked like jasper and carnelian, and surrounding the throne was a rainbow that looked like an emerald, and twenty-four thrones with twenty-four elders seated upon them surrounded the throne. The elders were dressed in white clothing and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came lightning and voices and thunder. And in front of the throne were seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God. Something like a glass sea, like crystal, was in front of the throne. 
And in the center by the throne were four living creatures encircling the throne. These creatures were covered with eyes on the front and on the back. And the first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like an ox. The third living creature had a face like a human being. The fourth living creature was like an eagle in flight. And each of the four living creatures had six wings. And each was covered all around and on the inside with eyes and they never rest day or night but keep on saying holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is coming and whenever the living creatures give glory honor and thanks to the one seated on the throne who lives forever and always the 24 elders fall before the one seated on the throne they worship the one who lives forever and always. They throw down their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power because you created all things. It is by your will that they existed and were created. And then I'm going to skip some here. As we go into chapter 5, John looks up and there's a scroll. And this angel calls out. It turns out this scroll is... Um, the narration of history moving forward. He was going to be showing the things that must take place. These are the things that must take place. Uh, history moving forward, sealed by seven seals, and an angel cries out in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? That is, who is worthy to carry out God's plan for redemption and reconciliation in this moment? And uh, no one in heaven or on earth or below the earth was able to answer and so John begins to cry because there's no one to take up God's purposes in the world um, and then the angel in verse 5 of Revelation 5 or the elder rather who's talking to him tells John he says don't weep look the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has emerged victorious so that he can open the scroll in its seven seals and then in between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as if it had been slain. It had seven horns and seven eyes, which are God's seven spirits, sent out into the whole earth. He came forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one seated on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each held a harp and gold bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they took up a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and by your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they will rule over the earth. Then I looked and I heard the sound of many angels surrounding the throne, the living creatures and the elders. They numbered in the millions, thousands upon thousands, and they said in a loud voice, Worthy is the slaughtered lamb to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, I heard everything everywhere say blessing, honor, glory and power belong to the one seated on the throne, to the Lamb forever and always. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. What I love about this text is, especially in the context of talking about the sacrament of worship, is that it's, it's all about worship. You have in chapter 4, um, this is, if you picture Revelation as a, um, as a play, this is a screenplay for a play. Uh, chapter 4 is where you set the scene. This describes the throne room of God and God sitting on the throne and those around the throne. And what you have are this combination of uh, spiritual angelic creatures and the elders, as they are described, surrounding the throne of God. And as they set the scene, the elders and the angelic creatures, they are in constant praise of God. And those who know Revelation best will often tell you that what you have here in this combination between the elders who are human and the spiritual creatures who are these weird amalgamations of different things as you have here the combination represented in symbolism the entirety of creation the entirety of the created order is arranged around the glory of God worshiping God and of course by the end when the lamb takes the scroll from God on the throne he's worthy to unfold God's purposes for this moment 
It says that at the end of chapter 5 explicitly that uh, all things everywhere, things in heaven and on earth, fall into worship of God along with these creatures, millions, thousands upon thousands surrounding the throne. So by the end of chapter 5 we have this moment of worship where the heavenly throne room is just resounding with the praise of um, the Lamb and of God. And what I want you to notice when you look at the way that praise unfolds is it is very explicitly the storytelling that we have been talking about is very explicitly a sacramental kind of moment. They are telling in their praise the story of God. Worthy in the Lamb who has done. Worthy is in the Lamb who, who has made. And if you begin to look through the Bible, one of the things that you will notice very quickly is that worship often takes, worship um, nearly always takes on this story-telling role in our lives. And so in Exodus chapter 15, when uh, the Israelites come to the far side of the Red Sea, when the waters crash down over the Egyptians, the first thing they do, and this is a good impulse, um, this is an impulse that we would do good to... Um, to develop in our lives. They come to the opposite side of the Red Sea. The, Re the Red Sea comes crashing down over the Egyptians. They break out in a church service. And there in Exodus 15 as they sing praise to God, what they're doing is they're telling the story of God delivering them from the oppression of Egypt. They tell God's story. That is worship for them. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 2 when Hannah is delivered from her affliction and God gives her Samuel it is praise that she brings in one of those beautiful moments of praise and and uh, what she does is she tells the story of God as it relates to her years and centuries later you will see um, another woman Mary pick up a very similar song in Luke chapter 1 and again she's telling the story of God and so the sacrament of worship is very explicitly that time where we um, in 2020 more often than and other times gather as individuals or we gather as small groups or we gather as congregations or we gather as hundreds or thousands in places like um, summer celebration to tell the story of God through our worship and if you think about it for just a few minutes that's what we're doing with our worship if you think about all of the best songs that we sing all of the songs that we love to sing almost all of them are ways of telling the story of God they talk about what God has done or what God is doing or what God promises to do and how that relates to us singing is for us in church an act of storytelling if you think about prayer <clears throat> when we are uh, even remotely on our game unless we're really just phoning it in our prayers are acts of storytelling this is what we do when we give God thanks God I want to thank you for that is a way of saying God this is what you have done in our lives when we ask God <clears throat> to walk with us or let me take a drink To walk with us or or give us strength or to be with a particular person in a particular moment whatever that moment may be we are telling the story of God in a very personal a very pointed way God you have promised that you are this sort of God and we ask that you will do the sorts of things that we do or we see you doing in scripture it is a, an act of hopeful storytelling when we gather around the table that is precisely the sacrament we've been talking about we tell the story of Jesus and his death and his burial and his resurrection and the bread and the wine when we um, preach and read scripture it is storytelling explicitly so and so worship what I want you to see this morning worship is this act of storytelling it is an act of telling God and one another and the world around us the story of God in the scripture and the story of God in our lives and the story of what God is doing in the future it grounds us in where we have come from 
And it grounds us in where we are, and it grounds us in where we're going. It serves as a reminder both of what has come before and what has come or what will come ahead. And in doing that, worship is an act that plants us in the present as a certain kind of people. And the way I was thinking about it this morning is simply to say that in a world that is inundated with false news, in a world that is inundated with a sort of cynicism and the lack of clarity that causes us to doubt everything, worship is a declaration of reality. Worship is the declaration that amidst all of the complexity, all of the lies, all of the manipulation, all of the spin, all of the ways that people try to change narratives, this is what is real in the world. Worship is an act of truth-telling when we do it best. And as people who gather, whether it's virtually like we have to do now, or we gather in person, this truth-telling as we gather around the table. You know, we we gather around the table and we tell the truth that God loves everyone in the world and there's room for everyone at the table and so all of these other narratives floating around that says that my group is better than your group or this group is better than that group all of those must be false we are formed and shaped into a certain kind of people by telling the truth God works in that moment to shape us into a certain kind of people when we gather and we sing you know for instance that most um, most Christian uh, songs and Jerry always leaves this verse for me when we sing it in person I appreciate it this is my father's world and though I oft forget that though the wrong seems off so strong he is the ruler yet when we tell that truth in our song it stands to if we will let it God stands to if we will allow him to shape us and form us into a certain kind of people worship is in the midst of all of the lies and the spin and the manipulation is an act of saying this is reality and as we come in and we engage in that reality God shapes us and forms us into a certain kind of people and this is one of the reasons by the way that I've always thought that worship was important there seem to have been a couple of extremes that we go to in our lives as regards worship there are those for all intents and purposes who seem like worship is the only thing that matters to them and so the emphasis in those traditions has been on getting everything in worship exactly right and so we will have fights about whether or not the cup or the wine a cup or the bread rather should go first or whether or not one can sing with or without instruments of music or and sometimes we get into discussions about whether or not someone should put a, a cover over the communion table or whether the communion table can be in the front or the back and we put all of our resources and all of our time and all of our energy and all of our efforts into this one moment on Sunday morning and worship is all there is and for again all intents and purposes for a lot of people it seems like Jesus has very little impact on their lives outside of what they do on Sunday morning. I've been that person who invested so much in Sunday morning only to see that um, I was not necessarily more joyful, not necessarily more peaceful, not necessarily more loving the rest of the week. And then there's the other extreme who we come to worship and we kind of just phone it in and they will they will say things and I've been, seen people like this and I've honestly been people like this who say you know we're here to worship for a few minutes this morning but this isn't really what church is all about now we're going to go back out into the world and do what church is all about and I'm sympathetic to that as well but what I want to remind you of this morning is that as a sacrament as we tell this story God forms us it is through worship that we are equipped to be when we will allow it to happen the sort of people who can go into the world and do God's work it roots us it reminds us of what we're about. When we come together and we tell God's story to one another, we are reminded that Jesus is Lord, not anybody else. That God is victorious, and so we don't have to fear anybody else that we are his people. Remember, the sacraments are things that we argue from, not argue for. 
the New Testament doesn't argue for communion. It says, rather, if you are a people who take communion, should you not act this way or that way? It doesn't argue for baptism so much as it says, since you have been baptized, how are you supposed to act? Worship is not the sort of thing that we argue for so much as we ask, how do a people who tell this story, who claim reality, then go about their lives? And so all of that to say this, the true purpose of the sacraments, whether we're talking about worship or communion or baptism or marriage or what have you, is to equip us and shape us to send us into the world to live sacramental lives. Not just in these very important moments, these moments equip us and shape us to go out and live broader lives that are sacramental. If you want to think about it in terms of going to the gym and working out. There's a way of looking at working out that is functional. I exercise so that I can live my life more efficiently. We enter into the sacraments so that we can live our lives in a more cruciform manner. Both seeing God at work all around us, because that's what proclaiming this reality does for us, right? It trains us to see what God has done and God is doing and to anticipate what God will be doing. So we're looking for it. And so entering into, leaning into, engaging with the sacrament sends us out into the world looking for God. And all of a sudden it's not God as some old man who created the world and then retired to his rocking chair millennia away to see how it all plays out. But he's still in the world, still working, still active, still doing things to bring about his will and we through the sacraments gain eyes to see that and it's also through the sacraments that we learn to live lives that tell the story of God through our own commitments to Christ likeness that we are called back to each and every week at the table of God or in the worship of God we learn to treat other people in Christ like ways we learn to act like people who gather at the table. We earn, learn to act like people who have been baptized. We learn to act like people who are steeped in reality. And so we are free to be gracious where the rest of the world may oftentimes be begrudging. We are free to love where so many others live in fear. We are free to tear down walls where so many others build up walls. We are free to approach things in an entirely different way because we are shaped by the reality of what God is doing in the world. And so um, one of the things I want to make an effort to do as we move forward is to be more intentionally sacramental in the way that I do things as a part of the Fern Bell Church of Christ. To ask questions like, how should baptized people act in situations like this? Or what does it mean for a people who gathers at the table, although in funny ways right now, um, what does it mean for people who gather at the table to enter into this situation? Or what does it mean for us to proclaim God's reality and then go into the world and live that reality? And I want to invite you with that journey or on that journey with me. As we lean into more intentionally, more deeply, more be beautifully what we have always been. We've always emphasized worship. We've always emphasized things like baptism in communion not less not different but more so let me pray for you and then I'm gonna ask you to pray with me and um, then we will remember who we are this is a sacramental moment as well we'll remember who we are as we go back out into God's world Father God the world is yours you are active and you are moving and you are working to shape the world Pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, hearts that understand, so that we can see you in the world, all around us in big ways and small ways, and that we would have the courage and the virtue and the character to join you. God, we are here today by virtue of our baptisms. 
we are here today having gathered around your table we are here today to declare your reality may we hold those truths with integrity and passion and creativity and wisdom and faithfulness we come to you as a family and we pray together our Father who art in heaven hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever amen we shall love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul with all our mind and with all our strength this is the first and greatest commandment and the second commandment is like it we shall love our neighbor as ourselves all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands we love because God first loved us and anyone who says that they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar how are you going to love God whom you have never seen if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you so this is the command we have from him those who love God must also love their brother and sister church will see you soon y'all have a great week